So my name is Kunal Jain. I'm a staff engineer in American Express. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software architect uh, working for American Express. My recent experience has been mostly on data engineering and the governance space. So think, things like uh, open lineage, open telemetry, uh, obviously ETL, D, data engineering really excites me a lot. Um, I spent significant amount of recent my time understanding and solutioning Apache Airflow for, for my enterprise needs, right? So we recently took a decision to start adopting Airflow for our ETL needs, for our different applications within, within our environments, right? So I spent a lot of time um, solutioning that for our enterprise. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, if you don't know Phoenix, Arizona, it is a Grand Canyon state uh, known for its beautiful scenic landscape. Uh, it's also known for its heat, so don't ever dare come there in the summer. So yeah, come in the winters, it's, it's, it's very nice over there. A lot of red scenery, red rocks, uh, amazing place. Uh, and uh, in my free time, I like to talk anything data, right? It's, it's my passion. And, um, and then I you know, do all my hobbies that I have but with travel, listening to music, catching up on my movies and things like that. So today we'll cover about uh, you know, our main agenda that will first uh, try to understand the context uh, before I go and drill further into my problem statement. And then the different solution approaches that we adopted, we prototyped, we did a POC on that and then the, the final takeaways that we had from them, right? And finally, we'll leave it to question and answers, and um, you know, we'll go from there. So uh, the context, I think that's important, right? I think it's important to understand why we are even talking about this problem, right? So we have a, uh, so I'm talking about a, a central data warehouse platform, right? Where we have a big data platform, where we get data from all the different sources. And when I talk about sources, we're talking about external sources, internal sources, and a lot of system of record um, you know, that we have in our systems, in our enterprise, and a lot of data you know, coming, uh, in, coming into this data warehouse. Um, so, and then we have different apps to support this uh, data warehouse, right? So we have ingestion app. Ingestion app, uh, as you can make, make out of it that with the name that it's a ETL, typical ETL uh, kind of app where we take data from sources, ingest it into our data warehouse. But in the process, we kind of you know, transform it, format it, do balance and checks, basic quality checks and things like that, right? We have a dedicated app for data quality, right? Where um, we want to make sure that any, any data we got ingested to our data warehouse it has a good quality scores, right? It stays up to some standards. So these are the apps where uh, we run some jobs on this ingested data. It kind of uh, do some data profiling, rolls up aggregates data, and you know, gives some good quality metrics coming out of that. We have data transformation app. So this is an app which is, uh, you, which is kind of uh, going to the central data warehouse joining tables, aggregating tables, creating beautiful insights out of that. And the output of data, out, output of that then goes back to the central data warehouse, right? So data warehouse is kind of in the middle, it's always kind of connecting with so many apps um, in, in some other, other form, right? And then we have data governance app. Data governance app, app is, is more where um, we kind of use it for DLPs. Uh, if there is any sensitive data sitting in any, any, any tables in the data warehouse, it goes and detects that. If there is any kind of um, you know, purging needs, archival needs, this app takes care of that. So when I talk about these apps, these are actually jobs, ETL jobs, some kind of jobs running in Airflow instances, right? So every app has its own Airflow instance. And uh, when I say instance, I, I'm using this word instance and environment, you know, um, uh, so you just, just, just stay with me, instance environment is the same thing in my context. And then we have a lot of consumer apps. So consumer, consumer apps is, if you put them into four different umbrellas, they are AI ML apps, which are actually using this data from the data warehouse and running the ML algorithms on top of that, right? We have analytics apps, which is running some kind of spot jobs or uh, you know, different kind of um, applications. Um, creating insights out of, or building analytics, analytics uh, insights out of that data warehouse. We have business intelligence apps. They are, uh, 
kind of doing this pretty much same thing what analytics apps doing, but on top of that, they build some beautiful dashboards to create insights relevant for the business. And then last but not the least, we also have real-time um, streaming apps, which also uh, uses this data. They kind of don't do some analysis, but they kind of uh, take this data, replicate it to the caching layer, and then from there, uh, you know, it does all the real-time insights uh, on, on that. So a lot of apps, a lot of consumer apps. Um, in, this, in this diagram, I'm just showing maybe a few, few boxes, but there are many apps behind that, right? And most of these apps are using Airflow as one of the orchestration tool. And uh, I don't want to go, I, I will not go to that question why we chose to go with so many instances because of many reasons, security, multi-tenancy, and whatnot, right? And people had concerns about, you know, my DAG, you know, um, impacting other DAGs and things like that. So we, and also the cost was another factor. Uh, so we chose to go with a separate instances, separate environments for each of these apps. Uh, So let's come to the problem. I think everyone now understands the context why we have so many airflow instances. Uh, but one of the things that we really uh, wanted to solve when we went with so many instances is that these apps, they need to talk to each other, right? They need to know what happened to my ingestion job so that I can um, run, you know, so can, I can run my process after that, right? Data ingestion app, wants to trigger a data quality app after, uh, after the, you know, the, the ingestion is completed, right? And then data transformation app, after its output is generated, it wants to again trigger a data ingestion app so that output can be ingested into a central data warehouse, right? So there is a trigger pattern, you know, which you can see as, um, you know, as, as we're talking about that, right? So there is, a, there is a data ingestion app, there's a data quality app, and there's a data transformation app. So the, the unique thing about this pattern is that the upstream app is aware of the downstream app, right? So it knows the, the DAX which is going to be running on those specific uh, apps. So that is how we call a trigger pattern, right? So where uh, typically uh, my, after the completion of my job, I know exactly what is, the, what is the other job or process I want to run on the other app. But then there's a different pattern that we came across which was a dependency pattern, right? So dependency pattern is, is where your upstream app is not aware of your downstream app, right? And it's because of the reason, because these apps probably came later in the game, or there could be many such apps, right? So it's not possible to have um, your one app triggering another, another app, but it, it's more about you have a dependency um, where you, you say, um, you know, data governance app is dependent on data quality app, right? And then similarly, all these consumer apps are dependent on the data ingestion apps. Your business intelligence app is, is dependent on data analytics app. So there's a lot of different patterns that we have, but in short, we had two patterns, trigger pattern and the dependency pattern. So trigger pattern is the one where upstream knows about downstream very well, well, well in advance. There's a tight coupling because you need to know both the details of the both the apps, but dependency is more loosely coupled, less coupled approach where um, you know downstream app just need to know about the uh, upstream app. Upstream app does not need to know anything about downstream app, right? So both can uh, scale individually easily. So yeah, these are two problems that we had. So these two patterns we started. And we started thinking about the solutions. And the first solution that came to our mind, we reached our community. We went through our different forums. And um, the first thing that we thought about is let's leverage our Airflow APIs to build those communication channels, right? So as you can see, we could use a trigger diagram API um, to, for, for, for connecting from one app to another app. And we can trigger the DAX. Uh, with a trigger, we already know what is the target DAG. So with the target DAG, uh, we can always pass that target, target DAG details in the API and it can go and trigger the DAG, right? We can always wrap it up with a good operators so that, um, you know, for end users, it's not a lot of effort for building those kind of, uh, calling those APIs. Uh, and then the dependency seems more like a sensor where we can use list DAG run API um, and that API can be used to uh, you know, so the idea is that the sensor will keep pulling that API for the status of your upstream DAG, and if it looks good, if the status is completed, it can go and, uh, you know, does the remaining of the task on their side. But one of the challenges that we had was 
with this approach, and we, you know, you know, we, when we thought about this approach, we kind of whiteboarded, did a quick POC. We realized that this is going to lead a lot of polling, a lot of polling on our Air Force instances. And if your instance is really popular, like an ingestion instance where we have so many ingestion jobs running, this is going to create a lot of problem, right? Uh, we don't have to only scale our environment for our jobs, but also have to scale for for the API hits that it may be getting, right? So we kind of rejected that idea. We didn't proceed much further on that. Although it was very easy to implement, we could we could have pretty easily created our operators, sensors, gave it to our you know community uh, within our organization. But it was with a, because of the cons, we didn't proceed much further on that, right? Then the second thing um, which we liked, I think, and it kind of. Um, made a lot of sense when we started thinking about this, that what if we bring an event bus in the middle, right? If there's one event bus, and all this communication happens through those events. Event bus is a queue, message queue, or whatever you want to call it, right? So um, what, our, what if we get all the communication you know, managed via this event bus, right? We can build some central components like event consumers, you know, DAT trigger. I'll talk about this event subscription later, but. We can build some central comp components to to augment the you know the 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 augment the intelligence of this event bus and and it so it can facilitate the communication or the events across different tags or different apps, right? So so what happens? Um, we can have an ingestion tag. It publishes an event, right? So anytime it completes a job, it goes and publishes an event. And that could be a generic event um, with few key details, like it has to have some unique event ID. It needs to have some trigger, DAG ID, target DAG ID, because in case if it, if it needs to have a target pattern um, or trigger pattern, it needs to have a, at least target DAG ID over there, right? And so let's look at the trigger pattern, how it solves, right? So it publishes an event. The event is uh, taken up by event consumer. It processes the, cons it processes the event and see if there's any duplicate event already there for that, it dedupes it, and then it goes to DAG trigger. Since there's a target DAG ID, it, can, it knows exactly what target DAG it has to trigger, and in, in our case, it's a data quality DAG which needs to trigger, right? And it goes, DAG trigger component hits the API to trigger the DAG, and we are able to you know, solve the one first pattern with that. Now, what about the dependency pattern? How do we solve it, right? So that's where we came up with this idea about central event subscription. Now, if we need to, if we are going to publish so, so many events, there should be a way for teams to know what events are getting published. So we need to somehow publish those events or event IDs to all the teams so they know exactly what events are submitted by each and every DAG, right? Um, and so that's a central event uh, repository. And, and then there should be a way to subscribe to those events. So those teams can come and say, hey, you know what? This DAG of mine is dependent on this event. So that way there's one central mapping which the central component will have, and it can use that mapping to um, you know, trigger the corresponding DAGs. Now you may ask me this question, you know, why we have to even build this central component? Why can't every DAG do a polling or uh, you know, be a subscriber for this specific, specific event bus? And, uh, and whenever there is a relevant event, it can actually uh, trigger, trigger the DAG itself. Uh, we thought about that initially, but then we realized there could be so many sensors we are running which is actually polling or which are listening to those event bus. We, we didn't go with that idea, um, especially when there are so many interfaces, so many instances of Airflow running, and each instance can have thousands of jobs running, right? So we, we didn't want to go with that. That's why we went to the central model where we have that mapping. And then when, um, um, you know, like this DAG can sub go and subscribe to the central event subscription model. And then once that event comes again, in this case, it knows, hey, this specific anal analytics DAG is dependent on my um, specific event coming from ingestion DAG. It can go and trigger that. Similarly for other DAGs, all of them can subscribe to that specific central repository. And whenever that event happens, it can go and uh, you know trigger those DAGs. So that's how we are able to handle dependency pattern as well as trigger pattern, right? By adding those central components. But now the challenge that we had with this is, um, I mean, the pros is definitely the, it is a decoupled approach. Um, each environment can evolve independently because you have a one layer in the middle which is not integrating uh, or which is not getting in the in the way of any environment scaling on its own. 
it's a good option for more than two to three year flow instances. If you have a lot, lot of instances, it's a good option. But the main con which I would say is you need to manage, now you have a central component, a monolithic component which is sitting in the middle, and you need a team to now manage that. You need, you need a team to maintain it over the period of time. And that's where we were challenged by our management. Hey, why do we want to spend money on this one? Can you come up with a different approach, right? So we took it as a challenge. How, how can we solve it differently? Is there a different way, a uh, different approach that we can do, which is less time consuming, where we can actually get uh, our internal community within the organization to contribute and evolve that code as, as it seems and needs very less central, needs, doesn't need any central stream to manage this over a period of time, right? So that's where uh, we went with the solution three. So which was more decentralized event-based triggers. Right? So we still have event bus. And I'll tell you the, the good thing about this event bus was that um, we had a side problem uh, as, we, as we were going through this uh, you know, solutioning. Uh, we came, came to know that these airflow instances can be even running on multiple regions. Right? They can be in US, Europe, India, Singapore, anywhere. Right? So you need to, we need a way to um, have a resource which is global. Right, so event buses are typically global, which comes from AWS, even uh, Google. Most of this public cloud gives you gives you event bus, which is global. So you can actually just use it, and it makes sure that that messages can can go across the globe. Right, so that's why event bus bus makes a lot of sense to us as we came, as we as we were unfolding more and more problems or or the solutions that we need to cater to. Right, so in this case, what we did is we have the event bus in the middle. We kind of created an event tag. Right, so event tag is Something we took from our event consumer from the previous slide. We took from the DAG trigger from the previous slide. We kind of get all those things together and we created a DAG in the airflow itself. So, so now all these instances have a, have a DAG running, which is now um, consuming their subscriber to the specific, the, the central event bus, right? So let's look at it. So all these are, they are subscribing to the specific event bus. And let's look at an example where what happens when events gets published. So in this case, events gets published and the data quality DAG gets, uh, um, you know, it, it listens to the DAG. And this is, I'm talking about a trigger pattern where the event get published with a specific trigger DAG ID and data quality DAG knows, okay, this is my DAG and it gets triggered, right? And similarly, dependency pattern where we, uh, these guys, no, okay, so there's no central event repository anymore in this case. So how we manage this, instead of creating a repository, we came up with a common convention. We decided, hey, you know, instead of going and taking a random, random UUIDs for event ID, let's, let's come up with a good convention which anyone can relate to, right? So in, in our case, what makes sense is we use a prefix for an app, like if it's a data quality app, we use a prefix like DQ, and then, and um, you know, suffix it with a table name, which it's trying to work on, right? So we use that convention and it was easy for us to um, you know, get rid of that event repository. And we just um, uh, you know, have uh, people understand the convention and they publish the events in the same format. And that's how people know that this is the uh, relevant event they have to consume, right? So, so people subscribe to these events or the team subscribe to the event, events in their DACs. Um, and then when uh, these events get triggered, when the publish, uh, publish, uh, event gets published, it's, uh, it's consumed by the event bus, and then respective event tags, they consume those um, events, and if it's relevant for their DAG, they get those specific tags get triggered for that. And similarly, this is another one, this is another trigger pattern which I'm talking about, a data information DAG which publishes an event and uh, it then triggers a data ingestion DAG, right? So we're able to solve both of the patterns with this, whether it's a trigger pattern or if it's a, a dependency pattern. Um, by removing the central components, it's now everything is running within the respective teams, right? So event DAGs are given to those teams. It's is given, it's, it's open to them as a GitHub repo. They can download it, they can install these DAGs on their own. And um, we build a framework around it. We build some um, you know, operators which can publish the events the way we want it. We don't want people to some, create their own events because it's a common central event bus. 
we don't want a junk or dummy message, a bad message coming to those event buses. So we're kind of controlling it with our SDK. So uh, our operators are the one which is being used to publish those events. And similarly, um, for um, subscribing to the events or what event they are, um, uh, you know, what that specific DAG is interested in, we kind of overridden our DAG class where they have a metadata to uh, say this event I am interested in. So uh, this is not shared within, with, with the community, uh, but this is something we have, we are managing internally and, uh, you know, we kind of uh, use our Airflow classes to, you know, build this entire framework. So the key takeaways uh, from this discussion is, I hope that you're able to, uh, you're able to make sense of what I've been talking about, why we approach, tried all the different solutions and why we finally went with decentralized approach. One benefit we got with decentralized approach is that we don't need to manage the central team anymore. Now we are able to use the power of our internal community to actually grow this framework and uh, they can adapt, they can enhance it the way they want it for their respective project, uh, you know, app needs. So, uh, I would say the key takeaways is that, um, I, in, the, in, a, in a nutshell, I'll say none of the solutions is bad solution. I think there is a merit to every solution, right? So if you are just talking about one or two airflow environments and you need to talk to each other, I think the first approach is, is pretty good. Right? It's very easy, very easy to implement. Uh, but if you are need to go to scale across multiple environments, don't go with that approach. I would say go with something which is more decoupled, use event bus or something, uh, something, something else which is which gives you that decoupling, right? So uh, in this case, you are uh, the first one, lower number of instances, you go with that. With the event based, you go with the higher number of instances. Uh, it's uh, on the decoupling side. The the first one is 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 not that decoupled. You, uh, you are very much uh, integrated with the Airflow uh, APIs and uh, a lot of polling and things are happening. Um, want to avoid that, so go with the event-based trigger model uh, where you will avoid that kind of things. Development effort is very low in the first case, high to medium in the another two scenarios. Um, very less ongoing maintenance. Um, it's a low ongoing maintenance. I think I'll probably do this. Yeah, it's a low ongoing maintenance. Uh, with central event-based triggers, high maintenance, need a central team to manage it. And then uh, decentralized one is that has a very low maintenance because it kind of scales on its own with the, with the support from your inner source community. Uh, cost is low here, high for the middle one, and the decentralized one is a medium. You just need to spend once and uh, you share it with the team teams. Uh, scalability, I think it cannot scale for many instances, many environments. Yes, these two, these two can definitely scale uh, with as many number of instances as you want. Like I said, with the event bus, the only other option that you, or the benefit you get is you can share those communication across across the globe, right? So if, even if your instances are running across the globe, uh, that will work for you. And then um, this is yeah, this is a nice feature, which kind of came as a side effect for us. Um, we had a need where we actually had to even share those events with other other apps which are not using Airflow. They are using maybe Control M, Autosys, and other batch tools, right? Uh, so there's a, there's a variety of teams which is using different apps. Because of the event bus, we're able to extend it beyond Airflow, right? Um, and the last but not the least, there's an the inner sourcing opportunity uh, with the last one, a very low ones with the first and second option. So I can see my time is getting up. So uh, I think my content is also done. So. This is my personal stuff. You know, you can reach out to me on my email, my LinkedIn profile, and I'm available on the Airflow Slack channel. Um, any questions that you have, you can always reach out to me. If you have any ideas about how we can make it better, or uh, you, if you think that it makes sense to even use it across the community, uh, we can even think about open sourcing it. I really want to um, get your idea and understand does it make sense to be open source and does does it have value in the community or not right so i'll yeah i'll leave it with this thought i don't know if you have uh, time for questions or not